Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Highly Inspired. I'm Ella. And I'm Jordan. Um, This week, we're really excited because we have a guest on. This is our first guest of this year. Um, And we have David on, and he's kind of an expert in the energy sector, specifically in oil and gas. Um, And his career has been in that, and he has his own podcast as well. And we're really excited. We want to talk about kind of the truth behind what's happening with climate change, um, what is clean energy? Is it really effective? What are renewable types of energy? Uh, what's going on with uh, the oil crisis right now and gas prices going up and just kind of a range of different topics. Um, and I think, you know, based off of David's background, I think that he's a really good person to kind of pick his brain on this type of stuff. And he's also written a book that was called um, What the F is Wrong with Every." else and why didn't they teach you and what they didn't teach you in business and I think that's also interesting because Jordan and I love to talk about entrepreneurship and kind of um, you know are you a corporate brain are you an uh, entrepreneurship brain and that sort of thing so we'll get into that as well but Mm -hmm. David do you want to introduce yourself to our guests and listeners and just kind of walk us through your background um, where your career started and kind of what you're doing now with your podcast and everything Absolutely. Well, uh, great, great to be on. Thank you so much for inviting me. Anytime I can talk about the truth about energy, which is the title of my my speech that I've I've been giving around the country, um, I'm very happy to. So I am an engineer by background. I have an MBA. I played squash for the U.S. national team. I'm a competitive golfer. Uh, so I have two two sons that are equally busy in all the sports and and have um, unfortunately a very open. Uh, an opinionated view on on a lot of the world, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, as you guys just from from chatting and, and hearing what you guys are up to. I mean, I think that that's so important. And you know, discussion and debate is the only way forward, and understanding is the only way forward. So, uh, I worked in the energy industry for 20 years. I was very fortunate that um, I was co-founder of a company in 2016 that we were developing assets in the Permian Basin, and uh, we deployed 65 million dollars in about a 12 to 18 month period. And we sold the company for roughly $340 million. Wow, that's exciting. (laughs) So so it was good. Um, I I stayed with the buyer for about a year and then I semi-retired and I wanted to focus explicitly and exclusively on helping raise issues around energy literacy, the importance of energy, all the tricks uh, I think that are sort of out in the world that, that people tell you the nice solar and wind will save the world. And really, I think uh, are doing a disservice to people who are just trying to do the right thing. So, so that's what I do. That's my background. And and I'm really excited to be on with the two of you. Well, that's great. Um, I think, I think that's very, you definitely are going to bring an interesting perspective. We're, definitely interested in trying to get to the truth and the bottom of a lot of these different topics regarding like the energy industry and climate change. And that was just climate change is something, for example, we've been, it's been, been shoved down our throats since like we've been born. So I think we just have a lot of questions and just kind of suspicions about, you know, what are real alternatives that are viable and what are just kind of things out there that sound nicer than they actually are in reality. Yeah. Um, but first, I kind of wanted to bring up the current event that everyone's talking about, which is oil prices. Um, and it feels like the short answer that we've been given is, okay, there's a war going on in the Ukraine. Russia's involved. We are energy dependent on Russia to some extent, and therefore there's sanctions on Russia. Therefore, gas prices are high. And to me, I just feel like there's more to the story than that. I know that even just like the pi- the Keystone Pipeline, we shut that down. There might be rigs here that we could use. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And kind of, is there anything we could do um, as a country to be more energy dependent at this point and not so, you know? So it's a great question. It's an extremely important question and I'm going to do my best to simplify it. Um, okay. And, okay. So the first thing you need to know, and we're going to focus on oil because obviously mm-hmm. oil through refining is how you get natural gas. It's how you get uh, asphalt. It's how you get 
byproducts for chemicals. It's how you get a whole bunch of things. So we're going to talk about oil. I assume later in the podcast, we'll talk about natural gas. Yeah. In the world, we consume a hundred million barrels a day of oil. The U S themselves consumes 20 million barrels a day. So of the entire global demand of oil, the United States consumes 20%. Now Russia produces around 11 million barrels a day. So 11% of the world's supply and they export roughly seven. They keep 4 million internally. And so the important thing to understand in terms of like, what's all going in you, do you own cars? Yes. Yes. Are they gasoline powered cars? Yes. Yes. Do you have a pretty consistent routine in your day, getting to work, going to see friends, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I would say so. Yes. Although right now I'm, I'm strategically choosing where to drive and not to drive because I don't want to fill up my gas tank as often, (laughs) but yes. And so, so if you were to guess how much less you're driving as a percentage, let's say, is it 10%, 20%, 30%? Well, what would you say that you're driving less? Oh, not too much. I would say probably 15 to 20%. 20%. Okay. And so that's a really important number because in the world, out of that 70 million barrels a day, I told you, 70 million barrels, 70% is used just in transportation. Mm-hmm. And so uh, because even with prices more than doubling, you're only driving 15% less. What that tells you is that oil is a very inelastic commodity mm-hmm. and it takes a long time to move off it. Yeah. And so even a couple million barrels a day of disruption, which we're seeing from Russia, because exactly what you said, the sanctions on Russia are impacting the flow of around 3 million barrels. That's 3%. Drivers are reacting, but not as fast as they might otherwise. And so the result is prices have to go much, much higher to make people change their behavior. Mm. And so, yes, it's Ukraine, but it's also COVID. We underinvested in oil and gas for two years. It's also U.S. policy. I mean, if you can recall, uh, the Biden administration, day one, they canceled the Keystone Pipeline. That was a very negative thing in terms of, should I invest in oil and gas? Well, Biden really doesn't like it. Uh, uh, this, there were Senate hearings in October where a lot of the, the Congress people and senators that were at that hearing were beating the oil and gas CEOs saying, you're producing too much. You need to shrink your oil. You need to shrink your emissions. You need to do less. We have to get off of fossil fuels. And so all of that's going on in the background that's reducing investment. And then the, the massive shift in the Ukraine war is why we see much, much higher prices. Mm-hmm. So... So that's how it's all interconnected. And it's important to realize Putin knows this. 40% of Europe's natural gas comes from Russia. 20% of their coal and 20% of their oil. And so Putin waited until the world needed his stuff and then he invaded. And so we can talk about all the causes of that, but, but at the end of the day, he's taking advantage of a world that doesn't think it needs oil to be able to advance strategic objectives for Russia that he, quite frankly, he's winning. Yeah. Do you think that, um, now you mentioned kind of this two year buildup to where we're at and it seems like, you know, the war with Russia is just the cherry on top. There's a lot of underlying issues that people aren't addressing when they're talking about this. Um, that kind of seems to be like the pattern in a lot of our media discussions. It's very black and white as opposed to, okay, this is a very complex mm-hmm. gray issue. And it seems like people react better in those black and white terms. Um, do you think at this point there would be a way to reverse course where we aren't having that uh, dependency on Russia for just a small portion of our um, energy and of our oil and stuff like that? So, so 10% of the world's oil being Russian is a lot. Yeah. So that yeah. number two, oil is very inelastic. And so if you've heard of OPEC, it's the organization of petroleum exporting countries, um, Saudi Arabia is sort of the lead, but the United Arab Emirates are in there, et cetera. And between OPEC and Russia, so OPEC plus, mm-hmm. they control around 40 million barrels a day. Okay. Before COVID started, if you remember, oil went from uh, about 60, January 3rd, the U.S. assassinated an Iranian general with a missile. And oil went up to $63 January 3rd, 2020. 
And by April 20th, oil was negative $37 a barrel. So not only were you not getting any money for it, if you produced a barrel, you were literally paying people to take it. Yeah. For a lot of reasons. But so um, declines of, of oil are uh, in the conventional world, in the OPEC world, would be 6% a year. And I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers, but that's important because if you have 40 million barrels a day declining 6%, that's roughly 2 million barrels a day goes away if you don't replace it. Mm -hmm. So OPEC has lost all of its spare capacity during the last two years because prices were bad. Also, the U.S. administration and Europe have said, we know you have a lot of oil, Saudi Arabia, but we really don't want it in the future. We're green, we're wind, we're solar. You're bad, bad people making bad, bad emissions and cutting up journalists with bone saws. We're not going to take your call in January of 2020. Yeah. Bad. And so now those countries who now realize that they're needed are saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're okay to take $100 a barrel. We're okay to take $200 a barrel. Mm. We're not that inclined to help you. Yeah. Even if they could. And then finally, the U.S. right now, supply chain around the world. Um, steel, very expensive, hard to get. Long lead time. So companies last September were planning what they were going to do for the next year and ordered all their steel. If they want more, it's six months lead time. If they want frac sand, it's six months lead time. They can't get trucks. They can't get rig hands. They can't get rigs. They can't get frackers. They can't get diesel. Everything's more expensive. So even if the U.S. could ramp up, it would be at least a year before we ramped up any significant amount. And so the short, the, that's a long way to say there is nothing the world can do to get off Russia in the next six months, one year, two years, three years. Uh, and therefore the only option is to consume less. And so price going up to $10 a gallon, $15 a gallon, if that's what you know, that's the only signal that the world will have to reduce demand and that will crush the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that this, this, these decisions leading up to this were strategic at all on the side of the West at all? Or do you think it just kind of has happened through um, poor policy? Because it seems like this, based off the decisions that both the U.S. and Western countries were making where they're like, okay, you know, Saudi Arabia, we don't need your, we don't need your oil. We're going to go towards being more green, et cetera. Even though we know that we are not able to produce um, as much energy with things like wind and solar at the level that gas does. It's just, it's just point blank. Um, that's where we're at right now. Um, so do you think they, you know, kind of want the West to be in this weaker position? Or do you think that it's just a bunch of people not being that intelligent to think this far ahead? A big question. And it, it ties to the boogeyman of climate change. Yeah. And Europe has really pushed ESG, so environmental, social, and governance. And they've pushed this huge divest fossil fuels. The world is burning. And they chose a small autistic girl at 13 years old, Greta, who wasn't going to school. And they flew her around or boated her around to have her sit at conferences. Notice she didn't go to China. She yeah. didn't go to India. She went to Europe. And she went to the United States and she went to the COP conferences and the United Nations and she cried. Mm. Very, very sad because you're burning my country. She's Jordan's but, doppelganger. I've been told I look like her. <laughs> um. <laughs> you definitely don't look like her at all. <laughs> very angry. had a very upsetting childhood. But, but so the, the defense fossil fuels, uh, the world is burning. CO2 is the worst. And they're all talking points. Like we, we can talk through the climate mm -hmm. change. Yeah. But we've created that before COVID was fear porn, we created climate change fear porn. And it's an emergency. Like we've been catastrophizing the, the burning of the earth for 50 years. We always, Al Gore said we had 10 years. Guys in the 70s said we had 10 years. And so we've got this narrative that says if we don't move away, then we're done. 
And so every policymaker has, has rejected the premise of energy is important and moved to, we must have renewable energy. So yes, it is our policies that have done this. In Europe's specific case, and I'm not supporting or saying anything against Donald Trump, but what Donald Trump said in 2018 to Germany and Angela Merkel in particular, yeah. 50% of your natural gas imports come from Russia. If you had 50% of your stock portfolio in, any, in, in Tesla, maybe it works for a while, but when Tesla goes to zero, that's a horrible diversification decision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Germany went all in on Russia while decommissioning their nuclear power plants, while not supporting coal and decommissioning their coal. So Europe in particular, but the Western world specifically, has made horrible policy decisions around how energy is made that has got us in this circumstance. And so we 100% enabled Putin to do exactly what he's doing right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Off the top of your head, what do you have any examples of what those specific horrible policy decisions were or have been in recent years, especially since then? So let's, let's start with nuclear because I think we can all agree if CO2 is an issue and if climate change is a problem, then we must decarbonize the economy. And the most efficient decarbonization is nuclear. nuclear. Mm-hmm. And after 2011, when the Fukushima nuclear reactors had issues in Japan and they shut them down, uh, there was a movement in Germany to denuclearize and they committed to get rid of their nuclear. And someone can fact check me on this, but I believe that going into 2011, German nuclear energy was around 25%, and now it's sub 5%. They only had six nuclear reactors left. They shut down three last December. They're shutting down three this December. So 25% of their power grid, they've taken totally offline. It was already built. They had their uranium. It was already decarbonized. So that was a horrible policy. Now, in the United States, Indian Point was a 2,000 megawatt reactor in New York City, and they decommissioned it April of 2021. Mm-hmm. Uh, it still could have worked. Diablo Canyon is a nuclear reactor in California. Oh, yeah. They're, they're... Is going to decommission. Yes. Frank was going down a path of denuclearization. And again, these are plants that are already built. So, like, forget the discussion of how expensive it is and what can we do and modular nuclear reactions. Policy mistake number one was we just denuclearized. Number two, wind and sun are, as we know, we call them renewables, but really what they are is intermittents. It's only sunny at best 12 hours a day. It's only windy at best 12 hours a day. If the wind is too low, the turbines don't turn. If the wind is too high, the turbines, you have to shut them off. Mm -hmm. And so there's an efficiency and a land use that you have these massive waves of power coming in and out and in and out and in and out, and there's no batteries to back it up. And they decommissioned all the plants that could. So, So in a nutshell, those were all the mistakes that they were using spreadsheets to calculate, like, can this work? But when you put it in the real world, it truly doesn't. And in every Western economy, we have shot ourselves in the foot by over-relying on wind and solar and under-relying on nuclear, um, coal, and natural gas. Something that, and if this is um, too conspiracy-esque, that's fine, but something that strikes me interesting when you're laying out all these examples is that, to me, it reminds me a lot of COVID, and that's in kind of our approach. It seemed like every country, especially all the European countries, the U S all, you know, especially at the beginning, everyone was doing the same strategy. And as new data points came in, um, certain politicians were holding strong on their position. Um, you know, we lived in California, so we dealt with Gavin Newsom and even when new information came out, you know, like it's doesn't hurt kids or, you know, we have the vaccine now it's nothing was changing. I mean, pretty much we were in masks until, a few weeks ago there. And so I think 
kind of the same thing has happened here and with his push to um, shut down this this nuclear plant, I think that the evidence has been positive in nuclear energy. Um, I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to shut down something that is functional, especially when you don't have a backup. And even last year before this got shut down, Jordan and I lived through rolling blackouts, even in Orange County, where we had yeah. like times where we would get emails that was like, okay, like you can't, your power will be shut off from X point to, to X point. And it start happening more regularly. And especially, you know, living, having the luxury of li living in a first world country and economy, that was something that we had never experienced before. And it just feels like either you're an idiot or you're getting some sort of, you know, orders from higher up to conduct yourself in this matter of making decisions that doesn't make sense. And it seems like it's very streamlined across multiple different countries. Um, and it seems like some of these leaders kind of come out of the same organizations and are tied to these bigger global organizations that might have other interests outside of just the state of California or the country of Germany or, or that sort of thing. Do you kind of see that pattern at all or? Sure. So, so California is a great case and I call it in, in all of my writing, I call it intellectual consistency and honesty. And I, and I, I know that it's hard to change and, and tell people you were wrong. Right. And, and so I'll use Fauci in a non-controversial way. Everyone will remember in March of 2020, he said masks don't work. The pandemic plans of the WHO do not include masks. He then came out and said, they actually do work, but I lied to you because I needed to make sure that the doctors had them. And so he told the noble lie, but there's more and more evidence that shows that masks really never worked. Mm -hmm. And so instead of him saying, you know what, the mask never did work. And, and, and so you end up down a path. So intellectual consistency in Gavin Newsom's case, they're outlawing everything. They're forcing emission standards. They're selling carbon credits, which is the only way Tesla's profitable. And now they're allowing diesel backup generators for houses that they previously excluded because they were so bad for the environment, but now they realize they have power and the voters will be mad. So they let you buy a diesel generator, which is way worse. Mm. Joe Biden just this week announced that he's going to change the standards. So between June 1st and September 15th, have you heard of E E15 gasoline where the ethanol is blended in with gasoline? Yeah. So between June and September 15th, E15, so 15% blend, is has too many pollutants and it creates too much smog. Now, 40% of the US's corn stock is used to make ethanol. And in order for Biden to lower gas prices five cents a gallon in a global food crisis, he's going to allow them to continue to blend 15%, even though smog and pollution will be way worse. So what is the real goal of our policies? And, and I'm going to say it's the same with COVID. It's the same with everything. There is $130 trillion that will need to be spent in the United States based on an independent study between now and 2050 to get to net zero. If the average profit margin is 30%, there is 40 plus trillion dollars that is going to be made by uh, companies, tech startups, investors, Wall Street, 30%, $40 trillion of wealth to rebuild what we have already so that they get rich and then they continue to give money to the politicians through campaign fundraising and campaign. Mm -hmm. They only care about being reelected. Yeah. So no one is allowed to have the conversation around reduced consumption. How do we become more efficient? Do we really need to rebuild everything? So at the core, it's that $130 trillion everyone wants a piece of. I see. Figure out how to get it. And that <laughs> core mistake that, that we as citizens aren't looking at and that politicians are too afraid to raise because they'll lose their campaign contributions. And without money and a platform, you don't get elected. Yeah, it seems very similar to kind of the vaccine approach where there was, um, you know, things like monoclonal antibodies and stuff that were in circulation before the vaccine that weren't really being promoted as treatment. And then the vaccine came along and that was an opportunity for big pharma to make a lot of money. And so that was the only 
treatment or preventative that was getting any attention. All the things that were cheaper, you know, something as simple as vitamin D where you go outside or take supplements, um, that wasn't getting hardly any attention. So so it kind of seems like a similar thing where you're saying that there's things that we can do right now to reduce consumption, to try to be more strategic with our energy consumption to try to use the nuclear power plants that we have right now that we're shutting down. But because of this opportunity to make a lot of money, um, there isn't a lot of incentive to do that. Is, am I hearing you? Oh, absolutely. And, and I agree. So you, you kicked that off as it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but but yeah, <laughs> keyword, but, <laughs> but I, I, I feel like I'm crazy all the time. And, and obviously I'm a very science driven person. Yeah. I'm a math driven person. I write all the time. Pfizer guided to 50 plus billion dollars of revenue for the vaccine this year, a vaccine they make 30% profit margins on have no product liability. And the government for a time was mandating that people take it even though we knew in some, like it didn't make a difference whether you, you could catch and spread COVID with or yeah. without the vaccine. For the two of you, for me, my two sons, I'm not vaccinated. My two sons aren't vaccinated. We had COVID. We survived in the miracle yeah. miracles. But there's so much money to be made. And then when you point that out, you get yelled at. And then the same politicians who try and shout you down then turn around and say oil and gas is windfall profiting on these crazy prices when oil is a global commodity. We don't control it at all. Yeah. At all. Whereas Pfizer controlled every single part of the vaccine, including the trial that they themselves funded and ran for their own vaccine to get approved. Yeah. So yes, we sound crazy and, and nuts and conspiratorial, but, but absolutely, it is that way. And as long as we don't have open and honest, transparent discussions, every single person who's a climate change activist who calls me a denier, I invite them to come on my podcast and debate mm-hmm. me. And not a single person out of 30 invites so far has said yes. Because I will, when they say, well, climate, there will be climate uh, refugees, well, where will they be coming from? in low lying places in the world. Well, do you know that 110 million people in the world today already live below sea level because we built cities below sea level? Yeah. Well, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but the, but the children, you're racist. They, <laughs> and that, yeah. That, sir, because they cannot win on facts and data. They just tell a better story. CO2 going up, temperature going up, super scary super scary. You should be scared. And if you, and if the science is settled, COVID, the vaccines are safe and effective. Everything is good. Don't look behind the curtain. That's interesting. I do have a question though. Um, if you're, if you're willing to explain, like say that $130 trillion number that we're shooting for to, to reach net zero, like where are you getting that from some of these numbers that you've suggested in the last couple of minutes? Like where, where have you gathered some of this math? So, so there's a study that was put out by IRENA, which, which is, is an acronym for something. They're actually a renewable agency, which is crazy. <laughs> Mark Jacobson, a professor out of Stanford, talked about the incremental cost of energy that's in the range. Uh, Wood McKenzie's put out a study that it's four to nine trillion dollars a year that you have to spend between now and 2050. Google, in their on our way to net zero, has said 130 trillion dollars. BlackRock, the largest independent investment, has quoted the same number. Okay. And there was an article that was in Nature magazine. Um, and so, so I want to for your listeners because again, yeah. everything is about trade offs, and and I want to tie it back to COVID because COVID is climate change. They're, they're the same religion. No one wants to talk about the trade-offs of, should we trade 87 year old, 30 year smoking grandma's life and extend her life by four months by locking down, by shutting down kids in school? That's the trade-off that we should have been having a conversation. Yeah. Are the young people the future or are the people who've already lived their life the future? There's not an answer, but let's have that chat. Mm. So for climate change, I want to put this, Every single person in the U.S. will have to spend $11,300 of after-tax income for the next 29 years. 
which means every listener of this podcast, you, me, everyone, that's roughly $320,000 per person above taxes to rebuild the infrastructure to get to net zero. Now, if we don't rebuild the infrastructure at all, the cost is zero. Mm -hmm. $11,300 per person to rebuild the grid, build the smart cars, build the batteries, build the transmission lines, the solar, the wind, the da, the da, while we shut down other things. And this is by 2050, you said. And so, so, so a family of four will pay $1.3 million. For which 29 years. Everyone's, that exceeds everyone's home equity. It exceeds all the earning potential. We're already having eviction moratoriums for people that can't pay rent. There's a stat that says something like 42% of Americans don't have $400 in their bank account for an emergency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we're now expecting that each one is going to pay 11000 COVID, the Federal Reserve printed six roughly trillion dollars and sent out money like it was going out of style, right? PPP, PPP2, it was buy bonds, buy securities, go crazy. Mm -hmm. We would have a COVID-like financial crisis every single year for 29 years and inflation is already eight and a half percent. Yeah. I mean, so that those are the trade-offs. So whenever someone says, but the climate is burning and the planet is dying, I say, okay, well, here's how much it costs to fix it. And most people say they'd spend $5 or $10 a month to help. Yeah. Not spending $1,000 a month to help. Yeah. And that's the key point. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. I think that I wanted to kind of touch on the term climate change denier because that kind of seems to be a huge thing in our um, in our culture. You know, with COVID, for example, it was either – you know, you're anti-science, you're killing grandma. And it's like, okay, well, there's a larger discussion to be had here. And there's even trade-offs within multiple different um, items. Like, so for example, us all wearing disposable masks for two years created a bunch of waste in the ocean. Um, So it kind of, these these things that, you know, we try to put people in categories where, okay, if you're, um, you know, you you're for climate change. You believe in climate change to the extent that we need to stop everything that we're doing and be totally do a 180. And also we should be wearing masks for two years. It's like, okay, even those two ideas conflict. So I think us living in this world where ideas don't conflict is just super unrealistic, but a lot of people, um, you know, they don't want to live in that kind of gray area. So in terms of kind of your position, on climate change, do you think that humans, that we have any effect on our environment or at what percentage of our use has an effect on climate change? Is it happening with or without us? Is it a combination? Where, what's kind of your thoughts on the science there? Uh, and and the, the first point you made there ties back to the money. The people making this case have become extraordinarily effective at weaponizing words, right? If you spoke out against Leah Thomas, you were a a transphobe. If you spoke out against vaccines, you were an anti-vax science denier. And worse, you were racist. If you said BLM riots should see people being arrested if they break into the Apple store in Scottsdale, you were a racist, misogynist, xenophobe. So they become very, very effective at weaponizing to shut down discussion. So I'll tell you my view. Energy is the reason that the world has thrived. In 1350, the last time we had an actual real pandemic, the Black Plague, there were roughly 450 million people on planet Earth, and 30%, certainly in Europe, died. So north of 100 million people died of the Black Plague. But the population of the Earth only supported 400 million people because you couldn't transport food from the rural communities. Like, it would take four days on a horse. You'd be robbed by a robber. You lived in a village. You were married at 16. You died at 35. You had three kids that you handed over the farm to. One of them died. Everything we have, a life expectancy of 80 years now in the United States, is because of energy. Every economy is totally correlated 
The wealth of the nation is related to their access to energy. In Africa, they do not have consistent energy. So they burn wood and dung to cook their food. And more than 4 million people a year die of, of indoor pollution cooking their food. So we talk about COVID being the worst thing ever. If we really care just about life, 4 million people a year die cooking their food on dung because they don't have access to that. So my view is I don't particularly care if the planet is warming. The evidence certainly suggests that it is. And the evidence certainly suggests that CO2 is rising, but water is a much, much larger contributor to greenhouse gases than is CO2. And so, so we don't talk about water as a pollutant, but then the complication in climate modeling and the book Unsettled by Steve Coonan is phenomenal. I'd encourage listeners to listen to the Joe Rogan with Steve Coonan. It's three oh, hours. Yeah. It just came so, out, right? But so here's an example. We do climate change, we do climate models, and we build a 60 mile by 60 mile by 60 mile grid. And we try to model if more water evaporates off of the ocean and builds clouds, do those clouds reflect sun or hold sun? And then if the water goes there, does it move on shore and move water to create different climates? And so there's all these questions. And what the scientists have done is they've, they've oversensitized the model to CO2 contribution because it's easy to put on a graph. Time goes this way and CO2 goes up. So it's a straight line. So everyone on the planet Earth who hated math in school can understand CO2 must be bad. So they oversensitize. And that's why they can't history match going back. They can't explain by between the period of 1970 and 2010 why the temperature of the world didn't really change. They can't explain how the rate goes. We had massive emissions cuts in 2020, right? Massive. The, the economy shut down. No one was driving. Why didn't the temperature drop? Where, where was that? Like, so, so they can't actually model it. And so my answer is, I don't care. Um, I, I wrote about this today, and, and then I'll let, I'll let you talk. So I, I know I go on rants, but I no, get very it's very helpful. I think that these are such important points. Do you know that the ocean level is rising? And this is agreed to three millimeters a year. That's a dime. Yeah. So if you're worried that the water level is rising so fast and it's rising one or two dimes a year, like unless you're standing on the beach for 50 consecutive years, it's still not going to get to your knees. But yet we act as though the rising sea level is going to sweep cities away. Well, if that's true, then why are the houses on the ocean fronts in California going for four to five to six to twenty million dollars, and that they continue continue to get building permits to like a house should only last forty years? So if we truly think the sea level is rising, let's just let it rise. Don't build any permits on the ocean, and we'll move everything back a mile. Yeah, it's because the rich people want to offshore all of the expense, so they get their nice ocean views. And they're investing in the wind and the solar and the batteries and the lithium technologies that's making them money so that they can pay for their expensive house. Yeah. So yeah. And if and if their elite if the elite's houses fall into the ocean, then they can then spin it and blame it more on climate change and carbon emissions. I live in Denver, I'm at fifty two eighty. The ocean is not gonna come and get me. Canada is a miserable place in the summer or in the winter. I used to live there. If I was in Canada, I would want every country on the planet to burn nothing but coal. Because if it was two to three degrees warmer, you know, summer is a little longer, golf season's better, people aren't wearing snowsuits all winter. I mean, I didn't see a girl's shoulders between September and May when I was in college because we were all wearing like parkas. So <laughs> in Canada would be amazing. But no one talks about that. It's like we just have to adapt. And as a, as a species, humans have figured out how to take the world and make it what they want. We are climate change. We cut down trees to build houses. We burn wood to live in Minnesota in the middle of winter. Those things were not possible without fossil fuels. And that's why the population of the earth is now 7.8 billion. When in 1350, when we had no energy, it was 400 million. That is why our planet is so populated because of energy. What do you think about the fact that I feel like we put a lot when we talk about just 
the general umbrella of environmentalism and being stewards of the earth and preserving what we have. We focus so much on climate change and carbon emissions. And then we don't really, I feel like we, we don't put as much energy into just keeping things clean, like not producing as much plastic, not producing as much waste. Recycling is something that uh, there's, there's some controversy on whether or not that really works. I've heard only you know, 15 to 20% of recyclables actually get recycled and we're transporting that all over the place. It seems like step one should just be looking at our consumption in general and just toxins that we put into the world. And I feel like living in a first world country, I'm actually, you know, there's so much toxins in, in our food and in GMOs and in just the production of things that, that actually scares me a little bit more in terms of my mortality and my health <laughs> than even just the, the sea rising or whatever. And not that that couldn't be a concern for later generations or whatever. Again, I'm not a scientist. I haven't really extensively looked at those models, but I do know for myself, what scares me is just all the toxins that we take on and, you know, knowing that that has a long-term effect on my health. And I feel like that is something that we don't talk about as much. And maybe it's because, you know, if we did, it would change how corporations run and how people generate money and stuff like that. Do you feel like that's kind of a missed opportunity as well, where we could kind of put the shift of environmentalism into those kind of topics and categories? It's, it's purposely a missed opportunity. Because we're not putting personal responsibility. Again, I'll use COVID. You protect yourself. If you are elderly, obese, immunocompromised, wear an N95 mask. Not a cloth mask, an N95 mask. Stay six feet away from people. Don't go out for dinner. Pick times with a store. Have Target, have the 9 to 10 in the morning shopping hours. Personal responsibility. But nobody wants that. Everyone wants the government to solve it. And in this case, with climate change, companies, we're not going to reduce consumption. Because if we reduce consumption, we lower profitability. You, you touched on this earlier. How about the fact that when we went to COVID restrictions where everything was closed, but we knew restaurants would all go out of business, we allowed single-use plastic straws, plastic forks, plastic knives. They all got shipped, and we made all of these plastics and the year before, they were banning plastic straws from being used because they were so bad for the environment. Yeah. So, so what happens is companies, they never say, consume less of me. In the, the same people who are the crazy climate, like the world is burning, I guarantee you they make Amazon deliveries. Yeah. They use Amazon Prime, and the truck comes to their house 17 times a week because they had to order a new little doll fluffy for their dog. To <laughs> and it's right? individually packaged. They don't even, it's they, in like a box. That's like four feet. <laughs> and then, then they're screaming at the person walking their dog outside by themselves, not wearing a mask being like, wear your mask, you heathen. <laughs> Jeff, right. The guy who gives $2 billion to the climate pledge in Seattle, Amazon sponsors the brand new hockey rink, which is called the Climate Pledge Arena. Has a yacht. He <laughs> builds a $500 million super yacht that has the same carbon footprint as something like 2,000 humans that they need to disassemble a bridge, an old bridge in, in Belgium, to get the thing to the ocean so he can go there with his brand new girlfriend and have parties out burning CO2 like it's going out of style. And so if he truly cared about the climate, he would say, if you were a prime member, you only get Amazon deliveries on Monday if you live in Phoenix yeah. and Tuesday if you live in Denver. And if you're not a prime member, you get deliveries once a month. I mean, and that is the extreme example of why the capitalists, Google, three and a half percent of the world's CO2 emissions come from data, um, data centers, Google, yeah. Amazon, yeah. Google, thank you. Because we're storing pictures of cats. The more storage we get, the more we put up our Instagram, social media, video. And so now we have all this computing power. And we're not saying, like, should we turn our computers off? Should we go for a walk? Should we, you know, mm. uh, should we turn in our car? If you truly want to stop climate change, here's what you do. You have vegetarian Mondays for the whole world. 
no meat because 14 and a half percent of global CO2 emissions come from livestock. So we can reduce 2% of emissions by getting meat. If you build eight and a half percent of global emissions come from concrete. So no new buildings whatsoever. And then a whole bunch come from cars. So we're only going to live in buildings downtown. Nobody gets any big space. You get a 900 square foot apartment lived in the most efficient thing ever. No cars for anyone. How does that sound? Well, Jeff Bezos wants to buy a $500 million yacht so you can go F yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's not going to participate in that lifestyle. (laughs) Well, don't you think that's kind of what has been the narrative recently? I mean, it seems like we're moving into these, you know, carless city ideas, um, everyone living in a pod, um, you know, being vegetarian. And I think don't not going anywhere for work, just staying, you know, in your one space all the time, never moving, never exploring, never traveling. Yeah. Yeah. And also something, something too, that's interesting about, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on the, the no meat thing. Um, and that the meats and livestock's, uh, effect on admissions because I've also heard that the way that we do farming, especially in the U S like huge agricultural farming, that also has an impact on the environment. So like, even if, you know, I always give that example to my friends that are vegan, I'm like, okay, well like almond milk, for example, is really uses a lot of water and isn't super sustainable and ordering vegetables. I mean, if you're going to your local farmer's market, that might be sustainable, but if you're going to, you know, the, your normal grocery store, that's, you know, importing watermelons, or some sort of <laughs> tropical fruit. Okay, that isn't sustainable. And we had we we had several <laughs> friends that were like that and you know, it's it's just not as apples to apples as people want to make it. Would you say that's correct? In nail head boom. So I'm going to make a recommendation again for listeners. You have to watch the movie Kiss the Ground. It's narrated by Woody Harrelson. It's on Amazon. It's phenomenal. I love Woody Harrelson. And they talk exactly about sustainable farming. They talk about the way CO2 gets done, the way tilling was done, the way the dust bowl got made, the amount of fertilizer that needs to go in the ground in order for us to make all the things. It's a phenomenal movie, highly recommend. Second movie is Seaspiracy, which the guy started out trying to save the dolphins, and then he looked at commercial fishing. So when you talk about the oceans, I mean, literally, we are trolling the oceans, pulling all the fish out because we just we want to bring in that tuna from – yeah. yeah. And you can't privatize fishing. So there's no way to keep it sustainable. Cause at least if you have like your cow oh. farm, it's yours and you feel some sense of responsibility. Whereas the ocean people just go, they fish, they leave it. Or, or an African person who sees an elephant and they have no money and they need to feed their kid. And that elephant has tusks. They don't care about the environmental protection agencies or the endangered species act. They're going to kill the elephant to cut off a tusk to sell it. Cause they just want to survive. So I would definitely recommend you watch those two movies. I love that you raise watermelon because I use it in my speech all the time. Like watermelon is the least nutritious food on the planet of the earth, right? Like you give it to soccer games, it drips down their face. You're basically dripping water. And in November, you can't get them in the U.S. So we grow them in South America. We put them on a truck. We take that truck to the seaport. We put it on a boat. We take that boat all the way up to California. We take the watermelon off. We put it on a truck, which then goes to Phoenix. It's then refrigerated the whole way there, refrigerated in the stores in Phoenix so that someone can come out, cut the thing, and we take 90 calories of energy to get one calorie of watermelon for a kid that mostly throws it away. And so, again, if we really cared about so vivid. The, if that was our goal, importing watermelons in November is – I'm going to use the word, it's retarded. That is actually (laughs) that word. It's the dumbest thing in the world, right? That's a mess. So, so yeah, we have all these issues because no one wants to talk about their personal responsibility. They always want to talk about the kid in Africa that isn't eating and is going to have a climate emergency, but they don't talk about their neighbor who they know their parents beat their kid They have no money, so the only meal that that child gets is at school, and their only opportunity to leave that environment is to get educated to grade 12 and get a college education. So we care about the random kid in Africa that we'll never touch, never see, never think about, but we cry at our social gatherings with our friends. But little Johnny is right next door that you can go take books to, food to, fix. And, and so we've totally 
outsource this feeling of dread and guilt and like fear porn to make us feel good. Yeah. So well, posting I- posting pictures on Instagram of of helping a, a starving African village will get you more street cred than you know helping just a friend who's in a predicament like that. Yeah, and social media hasn't helped with. I mean, we've gone through one cast gate after the next and we just did this on our lap we did this on our last episode we talked about i support the current thing and that conversation especially with social media where it went from posting the black square to posting a photo of your vaccine status to doing the ukraine flag little sticker yeah the sticker to doing the the ukraine flag we're all about um symbolism activism and kind of almost like a social credit score of making us feel good and it's very short-term fixes where when really doing the right thing doesn't always feel immediately good in terms of you know how others are going to view you because you might be doing it quietly or it might be a hard thing to do like to actually give up your time and like you're saying go to your next door neighbor and help this kid out like that actually takes time and energy out of your day than just posting your Ukraine flag. And I think that we've become this country of that kind of input output um, and kind of social recognition. Um, And it's sad, too, because I feel like, you know, I'm someone who does believe in capitalism as a idea and as a a system, but there's so much corrupt capitalism and these corporations have gotten just so big that it, it, it feels like it's not even capitalism anymore. It's almost like an organized socialism. Um, and there actually is one company that, you know, to kind of bring it back to like a positive note, I don't know. Have you ever researched Patagonia at all or looked into like the founder and kind of their philosophy on consumption? So Patagonia is the most anti-fossil fuel com- company that there is. Yeah. And yet all of their products use fossil fuels in their polyethylenes and all their fibers and all their whatever. And so Patagonia and North Face are, yes, they have nice ideas, but at the core, they won't acknowledge that they are using the very product they're trying to vilify. It's the same way that Starbucks allows uh, their employees to wear BLM t-shirts. As long as their employees wearing BLM t-shirts brings more customers than it turns off. And as long as the NBA can have Black Lives Matter written on this on the court and have everyone, you know, justice for Juicy and all the things that they have on their shirts. As long as that brings in more dollars than it loses, they will always do it. So Patagonia's shtick, and it started out well-intentioned, is I care about the world and sustainability and environment. But at the end of the day, they just want to make money. And I would be very interested to see what house he lives in, what cars he drives, and how much he travels. Well, what's interesting, so I'm reading his book, right now and I've I went into it being a little bit more skeptical but I do think what's interesting is that and again I don't know how much you know about the founder but he um he does acknowledge that he is in this like complex because you know half of his career he didn't even want to call himself like a businessman it wasn't until his partner stepped down that he had to kind of assume that role and his wife and him really did have kind of a poor lifestyle for the majority of at least through the 90s that's where i'm at in the book right now and i think that his whole thing has been like even though you know like Clothes are never going to be a hundred percent sustainable, but I think that they were try they tried to do things like okay, you could bring in old stuff and we'll repair it, you know, and and that sort of thing, and just kind of overall be like we're we're not going to be anti capitalist because at the end of the day, like you said, we're better off than we were in the thirteen hundreds before we became this production energy efficient society. And I think that he acknowledges that, but he's still trying to do small things um, to just not make it about greed and overconsumption, even though at the end of the day, he's still selling a product. Um, And if you buy something new, obviously that isn't super sustainable. So I did find that interesting and just kind of his, his position felt a lot more humbling 
and truthful, at least, than what I've seen from some other corporations where they might be kind of doing the same thing. They're having a product, but they're not grappling with the reality of the business that they're in. And that's why I brought it up is because in his book, um, it's called Let My People Go Surfing. Like I actually found that perspective refreshing, at least. Well, I will, I will definitely read it, but I, I think that you're, you're exactly right. And Google is a great example. They went net zero in 2017 and they, they declared they were the first major, major company to go net zero. And, and while I'm on the topic of Google, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, who benefited the most from everyone staying home during the COVID pandemic? They did. They did. Right. Their stock prices doubled their, their founders made who censors the data that said, use your monoclonal antibodies, go outside exercise. Right. Can you imagine if Donald Trump had said April 5th, turns out that this impacts fat people, which we knew them and I'm fat and you're fat. The whole country's fat. We eat way too much McDonald's and like none of us can see, like none of us fit in our clothes. We're going to work out for 30 days while we're locked in. Everyone's going to lose 15 pounds Mm -hmm. and it's the greatest thing ever. But of course that wasn't an intervention. The Google thing that's different than the Patagonia is they say they're net zero. In 2010, they founded a company called Google Energy that's FERC regulated that allows them to buy energy. So what they do is they buy wind energy in Kansas where they don't have a data center, they buy the electrons, and in Singapore, where it's run 97% off fossil fuels, they move the electrons from Kansas over to Singapore, and then they move the fossil fuel electrons over to Kansas. So whoever's actually attached to the wind farm is using Singaporean carbon. And so Google says we're net zero. So they're outsourcing so, everything. It's just done an accounting game. Yeah. It's, it's not real. And today on CNBC, they talked about how they're going to get there. And they, they use no concrete plans whatsoever. They just said, we believe in it. And people are making commitments in 2030. It's like this great thing. And we're going to get there. Everyone is virtue signaling with their flags and their fists and their everything. And if the Patagonia founder is actually living his values and giving away 100% of his money and making African kids better lives and sustainability than all the best. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because he was, he started um, 1% for the planet and his perspective on that was like, I've done a lot of, you know, research into organizations that are like climate change focused or environmentally focused. And his frustration was that a lot of them weren't actually doing that. And so he's definitely kind of, a skeptic, but still, um, you know, his heart is kind of aligned with the same thing that some of these other people are saying, but it seems like he might have a more realistic approach. And again, is kind of, you know, he's coming from a place of like, I just grew up around nature and he grew up very poor and, um, you know, grew up surfing and kind of in that era of the sixties and just kind of coming from a place of preserving that lifestyle and being connected to the earth and whatever. And I think that the consumption has gotten us so in tech technology and stuff has gotten us so disconnected from just camping and going on hikes and being outside. And, you know, we were, we were scared of going outside for two years, which is sad. Um, but I wanted to kind of make a shift and talk about another company, Tesla, that you kind of mentioned. Um, and there was something you said about how they wouldn't be a company if it wasn't for, uh, some sort of grant or something that people can apply for. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean Tesla. Tesla's a Tesla's a great example. Um, okay, so I first of all, I have to say I love the car Tesla. Mm-hmm. Like it is a great car. I would never own one because if I'm going to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a on a car, I want it to go more than three hundred miles in a, in a row. Um, and and I just like the IC. But I will admit, like I mean, not even admit, like empirically, the Tesla is a phenomenal car. Tesla, the company is so massively overvalued, it's insane. Uh, Elon Musk is a brilliant entrepreneur, and and we can go all day around Elon's current move into Twitter. Yeah. 
And I fully believe Elon is not a dumb guy. Currently, Tesla is valued around a trillion dollars. Remember when he tweeted, uh, have secured private funding for a company at 420 a share? Do you remember that? Yeah. It was where he got in trouble. He lost the chairmanship of Tesla. He got fined $10 million. The SEC was supposed to review all his tweets. And it was because he said he secured funding at 420. And, and split adjusted, that works out to be 83-ish dollars a share. Elon knows they traded a thousand. He knows his company is probably worth $83 a share. It currently has, it makes 967,000 cars a year. Toyota makes 12 million. It trades at north of 20 times revenue. Toyota trades at one. Yeah. So he knows. So I think he just wants to sell all of his stock while it's worth a lot. And he's the world's richest man to lock in his gains and then buy into the next thing, Tesla, or like Twitter, pick, pick your thing. So, but, but Tesla, uh, to get as part of the S and P 500, you need four consecutive quarters of profitability. Tesla cash flow negative from an operating basis, but California has implemented a rule that if you sell a, a combustion engine car, you need to buy a carbon credit from a car manufacturer that makes an EV car so that you offset your, your, your credits. So as a result of this, Tesla was selling $380 million of, cor- of, of uh, credits a quarter, and they were losing $360 million selling cars. So their only profitability was selling carbon credits to the car companies that are now trying to build EVs. And then they got four consecutive quarters of profit and they added them to the S&P 500. And because of the way money markets work, if you're a passive fund, you have to own the stock. So the stock went from 650 to 800 just by its inclusion in the S&P 500, which gives it all the flexibility to raise money, sell stock, do this, do that. So Tesla Core has invested around 19 billion in assets It trades at a trillion dollars. Exxon, by comparison, has invested $300 billion, and it trades at $250 billion. Like, it's insane. Yeah. This affair with Tesla as the company, because it's a car company that makes a car that has been recalled massively, can't self-drive, can't go more than 300 miles, You have to repair the battery. It has major, major fire risk if it's parked in a building. Mm. So um, it's insane. Okay. So, I mean, yes, I totally agree that Tesla is overvalued. I've said before, I think it's you're almost investing in an insurance policy with Elon Musk because he is – I mean, without him, I feel like there's no Tesla also. Um, And I do think that there is – especially like post COVID there has been this kind of weird situation with the market and, you know, cryptocurrency and there, and just, it's just been very interesting seeing these evaluations that don't actually aren't intrinsic. Um, and I had to do that a lot in my portfolio management class senior year where we were valuing companies and Tesla always came up and there, it, there really wasn't a way to back up, um, the share price to its intrinsic value, but going kind of trying talking about those carbon credits that you're talking about, if that were to go away, would that positively impact Tesla or negatively impact their NOI? So, so it, it would negatively and okay. they put the risks that, that they will go to zero. They acknowledge that. Okay. Because now other companies, Chevy, uh, Volkswagen, Mercedes, everyone is going in the EV, so people aren't going to need to buy the cars. Now, all of this is driving lithium prices up massively. Yeah. And he did a tweet, um, and I can't remember the magnitude, but the magnitude of lithium prices is up something like 5 or 10x now. And lithium is required for batteries. We go back to Russia. You asked earlier on, you know, what's the risk of Russia? 30% of the world's nickel comes from Russia. So you know, all the politicians in America are like, we need to get off Russian oil. We need to get to EVs. Well, where does the nickel for the lithium batteries come from? The same place. <laughs> we need to get 
on solar. 90% of the components for solar come from China, made by Uyghur slaves. Like, I, I mean, so we just, we, we really struggle to, to tie the thing. So, so with, with, with um, Tesla, it is a great product. The carbon credits, it's now selling enough cars at a million cars a year that it, it will continue to grow. And it's a wonderful car. Uh, it will get much, much more competition. But the fundamental problems are with EVs, right? Uh, so Chevy Bolt had a $1.8 billion recall because the batteries, if they're punctured, they burn and they burn everything that they're in. And so they had two fires on Chevy Bolt. So they recalled them. And this was the advice they gave consumers. Number one, you should not charge your car overnight. And number two, you should not park it in a garage. Well, that's not now, very helpful. Well, everyone's <laughs> going to do that. That's like, those are the two most important things and to making it comfortable. In the class, the Ford Fusion is a, is a hybrid. It's $28,000 a car. The Chevy Bolt is 42000 So you're paying $14,000 more for a car that can only go 200 miles. It takes nine, nine hours to charge without a supercharger. And at a supercharger in California, where the rates are so much higher, it would cost you between $120,000 and $180,000 to build your own supercharger, which is why they charge so much for you to charge the supercharger. And you can't charge your car in enough time, and you can't park in the garage. Mm -hmm. That is the problem with EVs, and it will always be a problem. There's a reason EVs didn't work as a market solution before the government put in all these policies with subsidies and et cetera, et cetera. Well, something, something that Elon Musk said on, I think it was the Babylon B podcast, which he said that the reason why he, and I don't know, this is what he said. I don't know if it's true or not. This is just what he said. He said that the reason why he went the electric vehicle route was not because he knew it was the end game solution to, um, reducing oil consumption, but that it was a transition into cleaner energy. And it wasn't, he said it wasn't from the person, he never thought about climate change. His perspective is what do we do when non-renewable energy runs out? Like what is the backup? Yeah. And I guess, so that would be my question to you. Like, what do you think, you know, take climate change out of the equation. If there's a finite amount of resources, like we, we can't keep this lifestyle going forever at some point. Will that run out? And if it runs out, what do we do? I love that question. And yes, with 100% certainty, the only thing I care about is scarcity. Yeah. At some point, everything runs out. And in the supply demand world, as something runs out, it becomes extremely expensive. And therefore, it has to be replaced by something else. So, for example, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a ridiculous solution to the energy problem. And a lot of people talk about it. The reason they talk about it is because hydrogen is storable and portable. So, but currently in the world, 95% of hydrogen is made from natural gas. And so instead of you burning natural gas for energy, you take energy, you break apart natural gas, mm. pick up with hydrogen, and then you burn the hydrogen, which is super inefficient. But they're trying to figure out how to use electrolysis, which could take like ocean water and you can break the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen using massive amounts of electricity. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you could put massive wind farms off of LA, which I'm sure everyone with a beachfront property would love. <laughs> and you could turn the wind and whenever it blows, you could break apart the water molecules into hydrogen, ship it on shore, move it and use it. But that's very expensive. So the answer to your question on scarcity is, the market will take care of it. We will run out of stuff. We will replace the stuff. It will be very expensive. And then people will die. And, and you know, I, again, I'm not really that popular at parties because, I mean, I have a, a humanistic, optimistic mindset, but I, I feel like when, when people don't have these real conversations and they're too busy posting a picture of their cat and their Ukrainian flag and their Black Lives Matter t-shirt, they're missing like the core crux. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Natural gas is now at least double. And in Europe, the prices are five times what they are in the United States. 
Natural gas is a primary feedstock in the fertilizer. Europe has shut down fertilizer building facilities, so there will not be fertilizer. 12% of the world's wheat comes from Ukraine, and no farmers are planting because they're being shot at and running away. So there's no wheat. We're using corn to make ethanol in the United States. For our oil. <laughs> right? For yeah. our oil. Lower prices, five cents a gallon instead of making food. Because of the war in Ukraine. Because the, the water <laughs> is raising a dime. <laughs> a dime. And so I, I'm like, I'm telling you, and I'm telling the listeners, we are going to have the biggest food shortage crisis of our lifetime this summer and this winter. There is not going to be enough food on planet Earth. There just is not. And it's not going to impact you or me or most of our friends. And so, you know, this is the virtue signaling. Yeah. In Ethiopia in 1983, the worst food famine they ever had happened. The population of Ethiopia was 40 million. One million people died. So that's two and a half percent of the population. We are going to have a food crisis and the people who live in these impoverished countries with no energy security are not going to be able to get access to food. And my estimate, just using 2.5% of the global population, is 195 million people will starve to death this summer. 195? 195 million people will starve to death this summer and winter because of the food crisis that we have brought on ourselves. It's almost like the carbon... As as dark as this is, the only carbon that's decreasing is people at this point. If these and that is a phrase that goes around a lot too, is like you know because we talk about um, a lot of the same people that are super extreme in climate change and kind of in globalism that sort of thing are also very you know they talk about the population being too large, but that also kind of ties into what you were saying before with how how energy has made it possible for food to go around and for us to not be in this model where we're just stuck in our village and we aren't being able to like transport different foods and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's really disheartening to hear. And I think especially since we just are so we're very disconnected with how our food even comes to our front door. Like I watched this yeah. time lapse of, basically all the steps it takes for you to get food into your home in the modern world. And it's just such a large chain of events. And um, I was listening to a podcast that was talking about um, the great depression and how one of the ways we got out of it so that people weren't starving was people just had to start having their own gardens. I mean, we did the same thing in world war II, um, but in places where they aren't even able to do that, I mean, yeah, there are there is going to be a lot of people that are starving. And I think that people have forgotten how much progress we have made even in the last 20 or 30 years with third world countries not starving as much. I mean, the the like most I think the most of the country or most of the world doesn't starve anymore. Isn't that correct? Like in the 90s and oh, the 80s. The CO2 actually is plant food. I mean, this is the hilarious thing. You and I, all of us are breathing out CO2 and we're calling it a pollutant. And plants, which we need to live, use it as food. So it's absolutely ridiculous to call CO2 a pollutant. The point that you said about degrowth, because that's what this is. We, none of us talk about consumption. The environmentalists who are super extreme and honest say the population of the planet is too large. And then all the capitalists say, no, no, we can always support people. And I'm just a supply demand guy. If there isn't supply and demand is high, prices go high. If you don't have money, you don't have enough money to buy food and you die. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's just the way that it is. So uh, yeah, I mean, we have a real, we have a real crisis. We have a way to solve it if we chose. Um, and, and in Phoenix, you talk about growing your own garden. I have a place in Phoenix. No, I cannot support. I have an acre, but I couldn't support 
my anybody I know growing food in Phoenix. And I'll tell you, when we come to scarcity, the, the thing I worry the most about is water. Mm. And I know, you know, they talk about the Phoenix drinking water kills a guppy. And it comes down that ridiculous outdoor channel, whatever that well, thing is. We have a sh- shortage in certain areas. I had to learn this to get my real estate license, but like, um, there's only two counties in the state that have an assured water supply in Arizona. All the other ones, it's unassured. So basically like, they're like, well, we can assure it for a hundred years, but past that we don't know. And that determines, um, if you can have wells, like it determines property value, like all this stuff in, in California, I'm sure it's bad there too. So yeah, I think water is something too, that we don't talk about. And I think that, you know, I, I do want to, I do always want to try to see the silver lining. And for me, I'm hoping that maybe some of these things, there will be, you know, a period of, of darkness and, um, potential downfall and stuff like that. But maybe there will be some sort of self-correction because I think even two years ago, like the path that we were on where, you know, our obesity level is so high because we're so disconnected how we get food and McDonald's isn't really food. Even though it it helps people not starve, obesity is a slow death too. And diabetes is a slow death. Now it might might not be as fast as you starving, but you're on medications for the rest of your life. You're going to have a shorter lifespan than someone who doesn't struggle with that. Um, And also the the chemicals that they inject into those foods too, the ingredients that they're using are also, you know, cancer and disease starting agents that have nothing to even do with obesity. Like they're, they, they create problems that are totally unrelated to that too. Well, 42% of people during COVID gained 28 pounds on average. So yeah, they told people to stay inside and not be out in the sun. In memberships, etc. So, so when you talk about looking for the silver lining and, and on the water point, all of us are three days away from death if we don't get water. Yeah. So what is my silver lining knowing these stats, knowing these facts, and knowing that I'm not electable? Because this is, I'm sure listeners are like super uncomfortable. Like this is not fun. Yeah. But the silver lining is if we talk about it, and if we can get politicians to actually focus on the real problem, I don't give a flying flip about CO2 levels and rising oceans because what I care a lot about is that if there's no water in Phoenix, like 3 million people, 5 million people cannot evacuate the valley and go find a place to live and find a 160-acre plot of land to grow their own food. Yeah, That's not the way the economy is built. And so the, the, the mass panic event that would happen would be beyond anything I could imagine. Yeah. What I do know is hurricanes drop an immense amount of water on land because the whole definition is when it's hot, hurricanes happen. The natural process uh, desalinates the ocean, right? Mm-hmm. Because it evaporates. So it's clean water. That's how you make water. And then it comes on shore, it cools and it drops. And so if we want to manage the water problem, if we could capture all the water from hurricanes and then pipe it to the middle of the country for irrigation, and it's going to be warmer because there's more CO2, we can grow more plants in areas we didn't used to be able to grow plants, as an example. And if that was what we were talking about, we should totally do that. Yeah. Batteries are super cool. Wind can be cool. Solar is cool. But you know what has reduced... No one knows it. Since 2005, the U.S. has reduced CO2 emissions by 15%. Europe, since 1990, has reduced CO2 emissions by 20%. Mm -hmm. The reason is coal to gas, natural gas switching. 5% of the coal plants in the world produce 73% of the world's emissions. If we just embrace natural gas... We let fracking is essential for natural gas. Yes. That's why Putin doesn't like fracking. Putin says fracking is for monsters. Mm-hmm. Russians were funding the anti frack campaign in the US because if the US wasn't able to produce the amount of gas we would, natural gas prices would go crazy. So Russia would be able to sell it for even more to Europe and be able to finance his war, not just against Ukraine, but Belarus mm-hmm. and everybody else. So he was anti frack. 
to enable his economy. So if we embrace natural gas, shut down coal, embrace nuclear, all forms of energy and have real conversations without canceling people, that's the that's solution. solution. Yeah. Wow. This is amazing. So that people can hear and listen and talk and learn and explore instead of being told they're too, you know, head their their sentence headline from the New York Times. I have a hold on. I have a quick question just because it's connected to what we what you just said. And I have been coming across this a lot more recently and I have a hunch it's going to be surfacing a lot more, especially on social media. Um, The technology for creating artificial fossil fuels. I have seen a lot of um, marketing surrounding this. I don't know anything about it. Do you know anything about it? Do you think that that's going to be something that (laughs) a path that we're going to go down, I guess? Possible. It is extremely expensive. You know, they talk about hydrates in the ocean that they can mine and break up and create the evolution of methane. Anything that's synthetic is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. So is it possible? Yes. So to the scarcity answer, you know, in 500 years, if the planet even exists and we haven't killed ourselves with our nuclear bombs, which is like a real risk, or if a meteor, if you've seen the movie, Don't Look Up, yeah. which a lot of people think was climate change, I think it was everything. I mean, yeah. everyone's panicked, and then the Earth gets hit by a, an asteroid, and we're all dead. That's what finished the dinosaurs. Um, but, like, I, I think that, that everything is possible, but scarcity is the limiting factor. And at some point, it becomes so expensive that the planet population has to come down to a hundred million or 200 or a billion, whatever the resources of the planet can support at that level of scarcity is what the level of population would be. And if you truly, truly, truly wanted, I mean, Thanos from the Avengers, I know this is a crazy analogy. He wasn't wrong. And, and I got to admit, I kind of cheer for him now. If he just snapped his fingers and half the people went away, our resources for our planet would double. Mm-hmm. So instead of having 500 years, we would have a thousand and it would be totally random because he snaps his fingers. Um, none of us want that because we love the people we know and we don't want to lose half our friends and half our kids. And, you know, you're going to lose half your spouses because divorce rates 50% anyway. But um, uh, do you think that part of the problem is that we, you know, you bring up the asteroid example. Like, I think that part of the problem is that we are very um, naturally self-centered, both in ourselves and in our humanity. And I think that that's kind of the crux of the problem with climate change is we think we're the cause and the solution, as opposed to um, we could all just you know, the ice age happened. These things happen, you know, these yeah, things we're, we're happened, little, we're, six we're very feet tall. little compared to the earth and compared to the universe. And I mean, if you're religious compared to God, whatever that, whatever these, these things are that are bigger than you and we're actually very insignificant, but because, you know, we come from our own perspective, we, we think that we have a bigger impact than we do. And therefore we, want to outsource our solutions to big institutions and governments and stuff like that. And then we're kind of in this standstill. My, my best friend says uh, ego is the problem with everything. Ego is the reason that the war in Ukraine won't end because no one can admit they're wrong. Ego was the reason that we thought we could interact on COVID and none of the public health officials would change their mind. Ego is the reason you fight with your spouse, yell at your kids, have problems with what ego is the cause of everything. And we believe that we can control and fix everything. And the example I use is from COVID and it's, it's, it's a really interesting one. I'm sure you guys remember before about March 10th and 11th, remember, we didn't really know what this thing was coming over from China. People were worried. People weren't going to Phoenix Suns games. They weren't going to Colorado Avalanche games. They weren't going to restaurants. They were terrified. They were self-regulated. I was going out every night because I looked at the data and I didn't really think I was going to be exposed. I'm 5'11", 
44. I don't have any comorbidities. I even knew that at the time. And like all the research and all the data that was being published by the mainstream media said it. So the old people and the fat people and the scared people all stayed home. And the young people were in restaurants that were a third full. And if, if we had not done anything, the terrified people would have stayed home. The not terrified people would have gone out. Mm-hmm. You might have died. And then all your friends would have been like, Ooh, I, I better not go out. I better stay in. But if you both survive, then another friend would be like, I could go for dinner. And then another friend would go for dinner. And then you'd go for the ball game. And then you'd go to the basketball game. And then you'd travel. And mm. humans will put their self-interest first. And it's egotistical for us to believe that we can impose solutions that are right. Where the mass of society will always do what's right. You won't touch the stove because it'll burn your hand and that hurts. You'll not swim with sharks. You'll like everything we do is self-interest. And Anne Rand, yeah. right? The virtue of selfishness is why capitalism works when you let those that fail fail. And in 2008, this was the beginning of the end of capitalism. We bailed out the bank. so the banks yes. and the companies. Yeah. And we only gave them $800 billion. We put $6.5 trillion into COVID. Yeah. And we had forced people to stay home, locked in their home. Their business is failing. They couldn't eat. Every single person in America would have yelled and screamed and said, let me back to work. I will take the risk of dying. But instead, we printed money, taught people they could stay home, taught people government would always be there, and now inflation is 8.5%. Yeah. It's- yeah, and I, I think that um, I think that what is interesting going back to the 08 crisis and then kind of tracking the next trajectory where we are, we are now is we don't let this – like evolutionary process of capitalism pan out. And therefore, you know, these big banks always have that sense of security that, oh, we can do whatever we need to do because we'll always get bailed out. Like that is not a healthy, that isn't real capitalism. That's corrupt capitalism. If there's a safety net, you aren't going to have that real tension. And when you look at, you know, if you take an economics class, you see that capitalism is a real science if you just let supply and demand do its thing like it will work itself out um but when you start meddling is when there tends to be issues and i i do think that if we had just let covid sit the places that wanted to take risk would do well and the places that didn't wouldn't it? And that sort of thing. Um, but I also, I also wanted to add just to your point of bringing up the ego aspect as well. I think that in that period of time, the ego thing was totally there. We just sort of rewired it in everyone's brains towards um, allowing them to express that ego selfishness and feel good about being a Karen. <laughs> yeah. You're, you know, you're, you're doing something for the greater good of other people, of your neighborhood, of your community, um, which is by doing nothing. And then by posting on social media that you're at home doing nothing or that you got a sticker that proves you got a shot in your arm. Um, you know, you get more points that then feed that ego. So yeah, that's a really great way of thinking about it. So, so and this, this is why discussion is so important and it's why social media is trying to shut it down. None of the things, everyone can verify everything. People can disagree with capitalism. They can have a different opinion on the social safety net, how much we should have given, how much we should have protected grandma. But the only way you get to the right solution is through discussion and different viewpoints and listening to people and arguing. And those that are advocating that Elon Musk will destroy free speech because he wants an unregulated internet is insane because it is the control of the internet that is leading us to not have these open and honest conversations about what the real issues are. And I I would bet, and and I would ask listeners for those who are listening, um, send a note, like, had you thought about any of these issues before? What do you disagree with? What do you agree with? What would you do about the water issue? And so we talk about market distortions Solar and wind is the ultimate market distortion, as is electric vehicles. If you buy a Tesla, you get $7,500, but they're a $100,000 car. So who can afford it? Me. 
I want a hundred thousand dollar car because I love the Tesla and I can tell all my friends about it. So I'm going to get seventy five hundred dollars back. It doesn't help the poor people. Mm-hmm. Wind and solar have preferential purchase agreements. I'm not. This is fact check it all day long. You, if you are a utility like Excel, you must buy every kilowatt of power that is produced by a solar or wind farm whenever it's produced. Therefore, if it's available, you must shut down your coal and your natural gas plants to accept it if there isn't demand. And that makes the coal and natural gas plants less efficient. But the wind and solar companies don't need to pay for that. Yeah. Here's another trick. Uh, Utilities are a regulated monopoly. And for Excel, their regulated rate of return that they are allowed to make is 10.2%. And so in Colorado, the state of Colorado has put in regulation that says 85% of the power here must be carbon-free production by 2030. So what does that mean? They must shut down coal and invest in solar and wind. Excel also built a plant called the Comanche 3 coal plant in 2010 that was supposed to last until 27. They're going to charge consumers a billion dollars to decommission it so that they can charge their rate holders all of the billion dollars and a 10% rate of return. So that's a hundred million dollars a year. They're going to charge consumers to shut down a plant that works and to replace it. They're building a $7 billion solar facility in Northern Colorado, including transmission that they will charge consumers $700 million a year of fees to replace the power we already have. Mm -hmm. So fees just went up $800 million for electricity payers, and they wonder why there isn't enough power to go around and why their bills are going higher. Yeah. Because regulation has totally distorted the market Mm. and forcing a solution that makes no sense. Well, the same thing can be said, I think, with the housing as well in L.A. Um, I interned for a lot of real estate development companies, specifically multifamily. And because of the regulations there with affordable housing and instead of being like, OK, we're going to promote affordable housing only um, groups, what they would do is be like, OK, well, 30 percent of all apartments, even luxury partner apartments need to be affordable. But when you do the economics of that and try to underwrite it, it doesn't work. So then developers are just like, okay, we're just not going to build new apartments there. And then your supply is tightened and then prices continue to rise. So it kind of seems like a similar concept and something that I feel like at least just visually has made me kind of start to be a little bit more skeptical of solar just in terms of, is it really that much better for the environment is I've seen these like solar farms in China where they just, it's hills and miles and miles of solar. And I'm like, okay, here's all this beautiful greenery. Again, going back to that environmentalism versus climate change point and really trying to separate those two issues as two separate tracks. And to me, that is kind of an environmental violation because here's all these, this beautiful nature and we're just putting a bunch of basically metal on it. Like, is that really great? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's worth it. Um, but the image isn't the most attractive <laughs> thing when you think of nature. Um, yeah. So, I got the amount of land to produce the same amount of power in solar that it does in nuclear. Mm-hmm. And it takes 200 times the amount of land to produce in wind, the same amounts in nuclear. Okay. And Solar and wind is a land play. And I actually had the idea today, I am going to try and permit a wind farm in my backyard. Okay. I'm in a very affluent neighborhood in Denver where everyone here would tell you fossil fuels are bad. And I want to go erect a 450 foot wind turbine with a blinking red light. And see how your neighbors- Doesn't the state pay you for that? Or can't you get a bit of money for that? But I'm going to go through the process of applying and have my neighbors all fight to not allow my wind turbine <laughs> yeah. to show the hypocrisy of the fact that they're happy to have the rural Kansas farmer look at that red blinking light and see eagles be killed by the, by the hundreds and birds killed by the millions a year. And I want my neighbors to fight. There was a, there was a proposition 
that was put on the Colorado ballot. They want to reintroduce the gray wolves, which eat livestock and, and small children, and reintroduce the gray wolves into uh, rural western Colorado. And it became a proposition on the ballot, and it passed. Now, where it passed is Denver and Boulder, and where it didn't pass is the community that are going to put the gray wolves. And the politician that is from that community in the Peons Basin said he was going to put a proposition on the ballot to bring gray wolves into Denver. Because I guarantee you, the first gray wolf that grabs a child and eats that child, the person who voted for that proposition. Yeah, it's done. I'm going to be, but it's all, yeah. I don't want the wind turbine here, but I need wind. This is amazing. Yeah. We're solving the problems. And it's intellectual inconsistency and ego that people won't see that. Yeah. So I think kind of, we've talk, I think we've covered pretty much everything we wanted to cover, but just kind of to wrap things up on, again, like kind of a positive note. So what do you think just super high level? So it sounds like nuclear energy, fracking, um, what, what other areas should we be focusing on if, you know, especially a lot of young people who do care, we do want to preserve, we do want a, to have this earth around for longer. Um, we do want to be energy independent and we do want prices to go down and, and stuff like that. Um, what can you just give kind of a high level overview of the things that we should be focusing on instead of some of this other just um, narrative stuff that isn't really that impactful? So, so this is what I would advocate. Um, I, I think everyone needs to take the time to read and learn and think about the problems of the world. And I know on social media, it's so easy. They, they teach you, they train you. And I'm sure you've seen the movie. I think it's called The Social... It's not The Social Network. The Social it's Dilemma. The social Dilemma. And the algorithm is built to scroll, 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 feed, feed, feed. And you see headlines and you take points away. Climate refugees, solar's good, natural gas bad, nuclear good, Ukraine good, Putin bad, whatever it is. We have to start researching and we have to start debating. Like when I was a kid, and I'm only 44, but when I was a kid, like I used to, we would go for beer. There was no social media to validate any of the things that you would say. And you would argue with your friends on totally opposite ends of the scale for hours. You wouldn't become this echo chamber of I only want to be friends with like the trans gay, uh, you know, whatever this environment, super specific echo chamber that only tells you what you want to hear. Yeah. And so number one, please read everything, fact check everything, be intellectually curious because that's the way you become successful. I mean, at the core where we started my background, the reason I'm rich enough to say all of these things and never be worried about being canceled and I don't need to work and I can research all day long and I can share this message is because when I worked, I did nothing but work. There was no work-life balance. There was no, what would I do in my spare time? I woke up thinking about work. I worked and then I went home and I thought about work and I did that for 20 years. I think young people are being given bad advice to like, think about these other things. There's a time to think about those things, but right now it's like work, read, learn, engage. And then the last thing I would say is, and you all have the platform to share this mm -hmm. and, and your friends who are all the climate change, all the time, all the solar, all the wind and do the things they need to engage in discussion with each and every one of you so that they see the other side. They don't have to agree with it, but they have to see the other side. And understand there's a balance because I will tell you, Putin is not going to stop in Ukraine. And as sad as this is, 10 million people out of the 40 that live there are refugees. Putin is li likely most of Ukraine will be gone by the end of this. Mm -hmm. and so you can put the flag and be all the sad, but you need to understand why he's doing it, what it means to you, and how we can stop it from happening in the future. And the reason it's happening is because our energy policy in the world right now is atrocious because people aren't educated. So educate yourself, talk to everyone, email me, call me. You can do it. <laughs> I'll go for beers with you. I'll fly to your city. 
Um, but we need to talk about these things. Yeah, where can people find you? Can do you want to plug your podcast and then any yeah. social media that you have or email or whatever? Under under the brand, it's it's hashtag hot take of the day. It's a podcast on Apple and Spotify. I'm on LinkedIn, David Ramston Wood, easy to find. And then my email is drw at hottakeoftheday.com. And I've said this since the beginning of COVID. I, I focus a lot on mental health issues. Um, I will always return a text, no matter who you are, even if I've never met you. I've had suicide interventions on it. If you want to reach out and talk to someone who cares, 303-253-0707. I will always respond to your text. But if you text me, there's no bullshit. And I will always give you an answer. Um, Yeah. So well, that, very nice of you. And also, oh, I did want to bring up your book because I read the description on Amazon and it, it fascinated me. So just super high level before we get off, what, what is the difference be, do you think between someone who's an entrepreneur versus someone that would be better in a more corporate environment? And can you be both? Do you think? Yeah. So, so, um, I don't think you can be both. An entrepreneur has to be able, if you stayed home during COVID because you were afraid and you wore a mask, you're not an entrepreneur. And and I'm not being offensive. You just literally do not have the risk tolerance. I mean, I would get calls at two in the morning from our field. Uh, A rig was on fire. Uh, I had a guy die. Um, we were going to lose money, then we're going to make money, then we're going to lose money, then we're never going to sell. I mean, the swings of emotion as an entrepreneur are brutal. And so I I put this in the back of the book. So the book is called What the F is Wrong with Everybody Else? What They Didn't Teach You in Business School. And I wrote it. I started writing it the day I got fired for the first time. And I went from the most important, egotistical, running the world, making hundreds of millions of dollars for companies, uh, hundreds of emails, hundreds of calls to like nothing. And my wife was about to leave me. My kids didn't know me. I lost my health insurance. And I didn't know what to do. And the way I processed it is I started writing a book. And the answer to what the F is wrong with everybody else is you. You're the only person involved in every interaction that you've ever been involved with. And so if people are mad at you, it's because you did something. If you're not doing well at your job, it's because you're not doing something. If you're fat, it's because you're not doing something. But the test for entrepreneurship is I I tell people, find a friend, ask them, do you think I'm an entrepreneur? And if they say no, you're not, and you should stay at a big company. But if they say that you are, then you should go and be an entrepreneur. And then it's, it's a real life. That's okay. an interesting test. I <laughs> want to try it out. Yeah, I'll have to try that out. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a great episode. It's going to probably go out, what, Friday? I think yeah. so, yep. Yeah, so for all of our listeners, make sure you like, subscribe, and please put comments in the section. Any feedback that you guys have or if, if anyone disagrees with anything that we said, we always encourage that sort of discussion in the comment section. So, yeah. 100%. I, love, I absolutely love what you're doing. I think it's so important and and to listeners, I cannot emphasize enough. The social media algorithms work on likes and subscribes and and it's essential that if you think that this is valuable information from everything you guys are talking about, you absolutely must do it. Otherwise the New York times, the daily will continue to be the number (laughs) one. one who's guiding all of the thoughts that are leading us down this path to begin with. So independent yeah. thought, independent podcasters, I commend you for what you're doing and I really, really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks, David. We appreciate it. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys.